Good morning. Good morning. God bless you. Welcome to the sanctuary on this beautiful fall morning. We're glad that you are here. Hope you enjoyed that extra hour of sleep. I did. I like that a lot. Um, and also want to welcome you this morning to a very special time that we'll have here in the sanctuary where we'll be celebrating All Saints Sunday and then we'll be uh, joining together in Holy Communion. Good morning to those that listen to us by way of radio or who will be watching us on Facebook Live or YouTube uh, this afternoon or later in the week. We're glad that you're able to join us as well. A few announcements that you're familiar with. Always remember that if you have prayer concerns, uh, there are prayer cards on the table as you came in this morning. If you have any particular concerns, any prayer requests, any praises that you would like to share, if you would see that those are sent to Patty May, and you'll see that Gmail address on your screen, you can also drop those off or call the church office or Pastor Willard will be able to help you with any prayer uh, concerns that you, that you have. But please take advantage of that awesome ministry that the church provides uh, and make sure that you uh, share your joys and your sorrows uh, with the prayer team. If you have anything that you'd like to keep confidential, uh, rest assured that if you mark that as confidential, they will respect your wishes. You know that there are multiple ways that you can continue to give to the life and the mission and missions of your church. You can send, uh, your, you can send your offering and tithe through Gmail. You can send it through financial uh, by a financial auto draft that you can have set up with your bank that's a very easy way you can use the Venmo app you can text the word give they're offering plates at the back as you came in this morning or as you leave but again thank you so much for continuing to support all the things that go on in the life of the church one special announcement we want to make this morning is uh, with Thanksgiving approaching we always participate in preparing Thanksgiving baskets we usually strive for about 90. We're hoping that we might be able to get that much. But those baskets are in the back uh, of the church. Inserted, or not inserted, but dropped in each of those baskets is a list of suggested food items that you can put into uh, that basket. You can also add some money if you would like, and that will help in the purchase of uh, meat and perishable items. And uh, what we'll do is we will bring those back together uh, the Sunday before Thanksgiving, which gives you two weeks. Uh, and, and what we've always liked to do is um, we encourage you as a family to do that with your children and let them help you uh, fill those baskets. Great opportunity for them to see the church at work and meeting of the needs of those less fortunate. We work with uh, Steve Gillen uh, in our first service to make sure that those baskets are distributed to uh, very needed families. And this time of year is always difficult uh, when it comes to finances um, and families with, with children. So please take a basket, take two. I doubt it would cost you more than about maybe $20, $25 to fill a basket, but we encourage you Take as many as you like, and again, bring those back the Sunday before Thanksgiving. Eric, I think those are the announcements. If you want to lead us. Would everyone please rise? <laughs>
body of Christ, would you join me together as we recite the Apostles' Creed, the traditional version. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Turn and greet your neighbor. Extend a handshake, a word of welcome, and then you may be seated. Our Old Testament scripture this morning comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. Would you hear the word of God? On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In this day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. God bless the reading and the hearing of his word. <laughs> Let us bow together in prayer. Eternal, holy, loving God, in this place we have gathered to commune with you and with each other through both the sacrament but also in worship. And we pray that as we connect human and holy in this place, 
you would speak to our hearts. You would encourage our hearts. You would challenge our hearts. You would empower us to be your people, your church. On this day, when we remember those who've gone before us, we thank you for your faithfulness that has brought us to this place. You put people in our, in our path, people who are no longer with us in body, but whose spirit will always be with us, who have made such a difference and impact upon our lives that we cannot possibly thank you enough for them. But we ask God this day that as we honor those who've gone before us and we look to you, that you would remind us that you desire to use our lives in a similar fashion to make a difference in this world for you and make a difference for others. So come, Holy One. Help us to worship you. Help us to be thankful for all that you've done. Help us to realize that even though we are fallen and broken people, your grace is sufficient for this hour. So come and move among us. In the hearts of all of us gathered here are many needs. Some we could put down on a piece of paper and share with others. Still others that we would not dare share aloud. And still those that in our hearts were... We are unsure how to articulate. You know them all. You are God. And we can trust you. So we turn to you. We offer you yet again our lives and our service, our love and our praise. And we ask that you would speak to us as we gather in this place today. And when we leave, may we say it has been good to be in the house of God as we have worshipped you and you've spoken to our hearts. This we pray in your name. And we pray for your sake. And we pray as Christ taught those first followers so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
friends. Appreciate that. Our passage of scripture for the morning comes to us from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And I invite you to hear this reading from God's holy word. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. This is the word of God from the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. Holy One, we give you thanks for your word that was inspired so long ago that continues to speak to our heart even to this day. We pray, Lord, that it would indeed speak to our hearts and encourage us, challenge us, equip us, and commission us to serve you as your people, your church in this world. Come, we pray, anoint these moments. May what is spoken from the, the lips, the mind, and the heart of this, your servant, enter into the ears, minds, and hearts of this, your people, that we all may take our next step together in faith, seeking to be the church and the disciples you long for us to be. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray, and all of God's people said, Amen. Many years ago, I had the opportunity as part of the staff at St. Luke United Methodist Church in Lexington to go to Lake Judaluska, North Carolina, the wonderful United Methodist Retreat Center in the mountains near Asheville, for a staff training on how to work together as a staff. And it was a great experience. And one of the afternoons, they'd given us a good chunk of time to be out of session. And so I, I made the trip down the road just a few steps to the world a Methodist Council Museum. It was a wonderful museum that unfortunately COVID claimed this last year and was forced to close. Inside this museum, I found mementos from early Methodism. There were from le letters from all the key figures in Methodist history, a saddlebag from an early circuit riding preacher, and interestingly enough, an entire display case related to the death of John Wesley, Methodism's founder. In the center of the case was a portrait and I stood and I looked at the portrait. At the time, I was the only one in the museum. I stood there, and it's just one of those portraits that invited you to, to come into the scene. And I had read about the last moments of Wesley's life, so I knew the story. And as I'm standing here and I'm looking at the portrait, I feel like I'm almost as if I'm there. The date was March the 2nd, 1791. Wesley had been ill for some time, and the dying man is surrounded by friends at his bedside. It's a serene sight. A biographer told of a man who had come to Wesley and said, Sir, we have come to rejoice with you. Wesley rallied, as so many people will, in the last moments of their life briefly, and, and he sang part of Isaac Watts' hymn, I'll praise my maker while I have breath. Those in the room knelt down in prayer. And then he lifted his hand, and he said, The best of all, God with us. And shortly thereafter, he left this world. And as I'm standing there staring at the portrait, I'm reminded of Psalm 116, 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. It seemed to be a beautiful, calm, peaceful, serene way to leave this world. In the years that have passed since then, I've recalled that experience on many occasions when I have gone to serve at the bedside of loved ones who I knew, short of divine intervention, would be here with us only for a brief time, to pray with people like Georgia Sick and Hal Blake, Amos, and Alice Kendrick, knowing that they were about to finish their course of faith and go to rest with God is a tremendous honor. Those of us who had gathered beside their beds experienced the power pre for powerful presence of God's Holy Spirit. And it was both humbling and comforting simultaneously. Now, that doesn't mean we don't grieve. We do. There's a hole in our hearts for each one of these people that we honor today, and so many more. But it does mean that we grieve, as the Apostle Paul wrote, not as those who have no hope. 
We have the hope of Christ. Today on what is known as All Saints Sunday, we remember these dear brothers and sisters who have gone before us and their contributions to our lives and to this church and to the Christian faith. And it is traditional for us to, to recognize our church members as well as others who, though not members of the church, are meaningful to us who have passed from this life to last ever, life everlasting since last All Saints Sunday. The actual date of All Saints is November 1st. And the reason for that is, is that the early church back in the day, in the very early days of the church, would often gather at the site of where one of God's people had been martyred on the anniversary of their martyrdom to thank God for that person's life and all that they meant to the faith. Well, over the course of years, so many people were martyred for the faith that the church set a date, one date a year, where everyone would be remembered, and that date is November 1, All Saints Day. For those of us who are into trivia, as my wife says, a wealth of useless knowledge, November, October 31st is All Hallowed Eve, which eventually just got shortened to Halloween. In the 16th century, when Christianity was going through the upheaval of the Protestant Reformation, so much of what we did as a people was called into question, and All Saints Day was one of those things. There were those who wanted to get rid of it all together. There were those who wanted to keep it just as it was, and still others who considered that maybe we keep the basis of what we're trying to do, but perhaps tinker with some things. And while I believe the Protestant Reformation as a whole has been good for Christianity, it raised some questions about the, about the life of faith that 400, 500 years later we're still trying to answer. Consider the idea of sainthood, for instance. In Catholicism, a saint is one who's been recognized as such by the church through miracles performed in that person's name. And they, they stand as intercessors before God on our behalf. The Protestant Reformation sees it very differently. In the Protestant Reformation, a saint is a label that is often attached to a faithful believer. So you might hear it say, oh, bless her heart. To be married to such a man, she must be a saint. Must be a saint. Like many ideas from our Catholic origins, Protestants have struggled with the, the concept of All Saints Day. Some Protestant churches today won't recognize it at all. They won't even acknowledge it. And still others, like United Methodists, have taken the, the idea and tweaked it. For instance, we don't celebrate this on November 1st. We celebrate it on the Sunday closest to November 1st, whenever that may be. As one who had a great knowledge about the early church, John Wesley valued All Saints Day. But he did not do so without question. He saw the Catholic Church as overemphasizing the lives of those who've gone before us. But he felt like those who wanted to jettison the idea altogether were being, in his words, superstitious. Interesting. Protestants not only differ on how we understand All Saints Day, we, we differ on the concept of sainthood altogether. Perfect illustration is found for that in the biblical translation of Ephesians 4.12. It's a letter that Paul writes to a group of people in the city of Ephesus. And in the fourth chapter, he's trying to make the point that it takes all of God's people working together to equip people for life of service. And he writes, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and they're tasked to prepare what the Greek language calls the hagios. The hagios. For some, that's translated as the body of Christ. The New International Version of 30 years ago translated it as God's people. And the King James Version of the text calls it equipping the saints of God for service. Which one's right? Well, in truth, they all are. But it makes some of us uncomfortable. I served a church once when a bishop in charge had issued the edict that we would all write a mission statement. And we were having a good conversation about what the mission of the church was. And, and I was allowed to offer my perspective. And I said, you know, I think the church exists to help equip the saints. And they shut that down right now. They didn't want a part of anything to do with saints. And I said, can somebody hand me a Bible? Let's have this conversation. The problem is in our understanding of what it means to be a saint. 
The Methodist tradition, like other Protestant traditions, understands sainthood to extend beyond those who've just been martyred for the faith, beyond those who've had miracles performed in their name, and nor do we believe that they have special standing with God. And we don't have an official listing of them, but we do have people that we know in our lives who we believe to be holy people. Hagios. That's been the case since the earliest days of faith. The letter to the Hebrews is the second, in my opinion, the most, second most mysterious book of the entire New Testament, behind only the book of Revelation. I say it's mysterious because, one, we don't know who wrote it. The early church put it in the canon, the Bible, because there were many who believed that Paul wrote it, but any close examination of Hebrews compared to the writings of Paul would say, no, that, that's not it. We, won't, we don't know who wrote it. Not only do we not know who wrote it, we're not even sure who it was meant to, to go to. There are some who have a theory that it was meant to Jewish Christians in Italy, some who believe it was meant for Jewish Christians in Alexandria, Egypt, and still others, and this is the predominant understanding of the church, meant for Jewish Christians in Jerusalem before the destruction of the temple in the year 70. People who have proclaimed Jesus with a Jewish background, who were paying the price for their faith, who were being persecuted, mocked, exposed to hardship and danger. And because of that, they were discouraged. They were beaten down. They were losing heart. They'd stopped coming, in some cases, to worship, which is why Hebrew says, let us not forsake the assembling together of ourselves. The author of Hebrews, whoever she or he might have been, challenged the believers not to turn their back on what they knew to be true in the face of the obstacles in which they were encountering. God's people have always experienced obstacles and challenges and hardships, but the righteous live by faith. In the 11th chapter, the author goes to great length to make this point. In the 11th chapter, we read what we call the Hebrew Hall of Fame. Over and over again, the, the author writes that this person, that person, the other person lived by faith, by faith, by faith. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel, and all the prophets lived by faith. The Hebrew Hall of Fame. But at the beginning of the 12th chapter, the scene changes. And these people who had faithfully served God before Jesus have now taken their place in the language of the author in the stands of an arena. And they have come to watch us live our faith. I borrowed from my friend Dave Espinosa, the track coach at the University of Pikeville, Baton. My son said it looked a lot like a vacuum cleaner attachment. A baton used for relay races. Relay races are, are those events that we in the United States, we don't really take much of an interest in except once every four years, and that's during the Olympics. We pay attention then. Relay races are incredible events. A team, most always of four, will run a set distance, each runner representing their nation or their club or their school will run the same distance, and then they will pass that baton to the next person. And the person who finishes first after all of the runners have run is the winner. But it's not that simple. The United States, for instance, has some of the best sprinters in the world. And yet we are approaching a drought of gold medals at the Olympics of some 16 years because we cannot pass the baton from one runner to the next without either dropping it or cheating by extending beyond the zone where you're allowed to make the pass and being disqualified. We struggle to pass the baton from one runner to the next. All Saints Day, and the message of Hebrews in particular, is the challenge to the church to pass the baton 
from one generation to the next. And that all of us will run our share of the race. We are to incorporate the positive lessons, the good lessons, the godly lessons of those in the church triumphant who've gone before us, who now rest from their labor and join that faithful crowd of witnesses. It is our turn to run. Which means first we must be ready to receive the baton. In the Olympics, there's a, a lane, 20 meters in length. When the runner approaches you, the tactical advantage is to be at maximum speed while still staying in that 20 meter passing zone and receiving the baton that's slapped into your hand without dropping it. In the early service this morning I had the baton sitting on the chair beside me and when we stood to sing the baton jettisoned and it hit the floor and it rattled really loudly and I leaned over to Joe Lane and said best sermon illustration ever. It made my point because that's a sound you never want to hear in a relay race, the sound of the baton hitting the track. The runner who is to receive the baton must be in the zone. Their hand has to be open to receive it. The runner coming forward must hand it and let go so that the runner who will then take the baton can take their place in the race. There are four elements to running our race today that I want to mention very briefly. Four elements of living what the author of Hebrews calls by faith in the midst of the crowd cheering us on. First, coming to the word of God with a willing heart. What is it God is trying to say to us? He's revealed it in his word. Coming to the word of God with a willing heart. The second key is being empowered by God's Spirit to respond. And you know, that one may be the easiest one of all because God longs for us to respond to Him and to His Word. Not just responding, but the third key is to do so in obedience. You see, no is a response. It's not the one God desires for us, but no is a response. And then to live each day by faith. Sounds easy. It's not. What happens in the midst of the challenges when we face obstacles, heartbreaks, setbacks? Do we give up? When we grieve, do we quit? Or do we press on knowing that the saints are cheering for us from the stands? It sounds easy, but it's not. Think of this. In the list of all of the folks mentioned in Hebrews 11, and I read through that litany, that great lineup of the Hebrew Hall of Fame, not one of them lived to see Jesus. It could be that our part of the race is to be one piece of a 500-piece puzzle that has no idea what the other 499 pieces look like. But yet we run. We do so trusting by faith. This morning, we receive the baton that has been handed to us. I think about some of these saints that we honor today. Some of them moved before I got here. We literally were on our way to see Rose Farley a half hour after she left town. But there are other saints of this church who we honor today who I did know. I remember Don Hall coming to our men's Tuesday morning Bible studies, 6.30. I didn't know Don when he worked the sound booth, made CDs, and helped us around the church in so many ways. His mental medical condition had deteriorated to the point that I was not able to get to know him well, but he was faithful every Tuesday morning, and Carolyn was faithful to have him there at men's Bible study every Tuesday morning, and the men of that group surrounded him and protected him every Tuesday morning while he was able to be with us. Georgia Sick was a Rosie the Riveter. 
I will miss her feistiness. I will miss her smile every time I called her feisty too. She loved that. And I will never be able to walk into a University of Pikeville basketball game the same way without thinking of Hal Blake. I will never be able to climb the top of the steps before the 11 o'clock service without seeing Hal Blake there. Or in a tradition I've never seen anywhere else in any other church, the ushers gathering at the back of the sanctuary before the offering to shake hands as if it were a coin toss before the football game. That was their thing. And when I look there, I see him there. And I will think of Alice Kendrick every time I put my United Methodist women's pin on my lapel of my jacket. Or look at Holy Communion on the altar. These people have left their footprints in the sand of our lives. But it's our turn. Our turn to pay, take the baton to be faithful to God, to take the baton and run as long as we can until our part of this race is over. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning we receive Holy Communion, and the elements were on the table in a Hopefully the day will be coming soon when we will not have to utilize the disposable elements. Did everyone receive their elements as they came in? The communion liturgy for All Saints Day will be on the screen. Your part will be in the italicized portion. I want to invite those who are assisting with the All Saints Remembrance to come at this time. Towards the end of our time of, the, of preparing our hearts through the liturgy, there will be the naming of the honored dead. As I call the name, Eric will toll a bell, Gregory will light a candle, and if you're present here on behalf of one of the families, if you would stand, Julie will bring a carnation to you where you are seated, or where you will be standing. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Let us continue with the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, God of Abraham and Sarah, God of Miriam and Moses, God of Joshua and Deborah, God of Ruth and David, God of the priests and the prophets. God of Mary and Joseph, God of the apostles and the martyrs, God of our mothers and our fathers, God of our children to all generations. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, 
gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Renew our communion with all your saints, especially those whom we name in our heart before you. Eva Adkins. Thank you, Lord, for this, your servant. Don Hall. Thank you, Lord, for this, your servant. Rose Farley. Thank you, Lord, for this, your servant. Georgia Sick. Thank you, Lord, for this, your servant. Peggy Branham. Thank you, Lord, for this, your servant. Bob Hobson. Thank you, Lord, for this, your servant. Hal Blake Amos. Thank you, Lord, for this, your servant. Alice T. Kendrick. Thank you, Lord, for this, your servant. And this morning, we are reminded of those who have indeed gone before us, some of whom were not members of our church family, but were important to us nonetheless. At this time, we light a candle on behalf of those who are meaningful to us in our journey who've passed in the last year, though not a part of this church family. Thank you, Lord, for these, your servants. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, strengthen us to run with perseverance to the race that is before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in mystery to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. With grateful hearts, we receive the body of Christ that has been broken for us. Remembering those who've gone before us and those who will come after us, we pledge to do our best to honor Christ in our living and our loving and our serving as we receive the cup of salvation by the grace of God. people of God said, Amen. Let's bow together. 
Holy One, we've gathered in this place to worship. We do give you thanks for those who've gone before us. But we pray that those who follow us will find us faithful too. That we might live by faith, even if we do not see the whole picture. May we run our portion of the race well. In Christ's name we ask, amen. There's a wonderful hymn for All Saints Day. It is one that basically you could really only sing one Sunday a year. And Eric is going to come and lead us in this hymn called For All the Saints. I invite you to stand. For those of you that read the music, it's 711 in your hymnal. We'll sing verses 1, 3, 5, and 6. like to thank you for being here this day and pray God's blessing upon you as you go from this place. We honor you, holy God, in this time of ministry and service, and we do pray that your spirit would go with us from this place, lead us and guide us into a world that is not able to live by faith, that is so angry and broken and hurting. May we go to love and faithfully serve as your people, your church. Send us now in the footsteps of those who've gone before us, leaving footsteps for those who follow us. Send us to be your people. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the people of God said, Amen. Go in God's peace. Amen.